Welcome everyone. Glad to uh, know that you're joining us today. I'm excited to be back. I went on a little vacation last week, so I feel very refreshed and ready to go again. So as you know, we are promoting our So Confident program. We do it continually. It's a big deal for us. And the January project is the Now shirt made as a jacket in feather whale corduroy, feather whale corduroy, that's kind of hard to say. Uh, and this is it. It has these lovely two opening pockets, has a sleeve patch and a vent. We've added a, a stand-up collar and a cuff and a bottom band that are all the same width. And we're still, um, we have some kits left and we're still in navy or uh, royal blue and hunter green. We're not sure about the raspberry. We're still cutting some back orders on that. So those of you who ordered raspberry and you haven't gotten them yet, it just walked in the door today. We are cutting the fabric as quickly as we can and we'll get those back orders to you and then we'll know if we have any raspberry left. But this Friday, we are introducing a new color of the feather whale corduroy. And so by Friday, you will see the black and I think this is just super luxurious. This fabric definitely has a velvety overtone to it even though it is a corduroy and it does have a little rib to it it's so fine that the fabric feels and looks like velvet washes beautifully so this will be coming to you on friday for those of you who are so confident members and also on friday is our very first question and answer session at noon on central time so i hope you'll join me we have another q a session later um, can't quite remember when that is, either the following week or the week after that, but uh, you'll soon hear about it. So I hope you can join me. It's, a t it's your time to ask questions about anything re relating to the product and the process and the garment. So I'll see you on Friday, and that's when we will also issue this limited edition uh, black kit. In addition to the now, if you signed up before January 6th, which is pretty much everybody, uh, you got a free Eureka top pattern in your account or in your course page. And we also received a new color of the fleece, which I think is really gorgeous, this beautiful teal blue. So we're going to be photographing this fabric on Wednesday and putting it out there also as another limited edition kit to make the Eureka top with the pocket and the extra seam and the different armbands. So watch for that. That's coming as well. We thank you so much for uh, joining So Confident. We've had a banner year and we're really, really looking forward to uh, proceeding through the rest of the year. All right, so I did have a request from a good customer to review the bottom detail of the Hudson pants, which I believe I had on the last time I was actually on camera a couple of weeks ago. So I'm going to do that first before we get into the topic of the day. So these were the pants that I had on. These are the Hudson pants in a chocolate brown wool. Uh, not really a crepe, but kind of a crepe. It's more of a twill weave, but it's very soft, has a little stretch to it. So if you recall, the um, pants, the Hudson pants, have darts at the bottom. Let me get this off of here. That might help. And normally, there are darts, two darts in the front that start at the bottom and extend about eight inches up, two in the front, and two in the back. So all I've done is inserted some fabric loops about three and a half inches up from the finished bottom. In, as I've sewn the dart, I've also attached the loops. So there are four loops, two in the front and two in the back. And then I've made a little drawstring out of a knit fabric that goes through the loops and ties. So it's as simple as that, but it's a great little detail and one that I, I kind of forget that I've done, but uh, obviously our customer noted it and wanted to know a little more about it. Now to make those loops and the drawstring, 
I start with a one inch wide piece of jersey knit, whatever length. And if you put this on the ironing board with the right side up and anchor it at one end with a pin and then stretch it like this and steam it, it'll curl permanently. And the more you steam it, the narrower the curl gets. So I just cut little pieces of this to make a loop and sew that into each dart. And then I also use this as the tie for the drawstring. So hopefully that explains that and you can have some fun with your Hudson pants. So today we're talking about t-shirts. And I was thinking about this the other night, thinking, you know, I don't remember when I started wearing t-shirts, but I am almost positive that I did not own a t-shirt until high school or something like that. I'm not sure what I wore, but I know I didn't wear t-shirts. And maybe I had a sweatshirt or something like that in junior high. I kind of remember that with my cut-off jeans my red sweatshirt, uh, standard sweatshirt, no embellishments, no anything. So I kind of looked up the history of the t-shirt and it's actually pretty interesting. Um, the first t-shirt that was manufactured was actually somewhere between 1898 and 1913 and it was because of the Navy. And the Navy produced t-shirts to give as a standard issue for underwear, undershirts. So for almost 50 years, the t-shirt was an undergarment. And then we had Marlon Brando and James Dean in 1950. And they became the bad boys, the rebellion boys, and they wore white t-shirts. I can still see those movies with them in their white t-shirts with their jeans. And that was the first time we really saw that undershirt come out uh, of undershirt dumb and became a, a, a primary garment. But it be also became associated with a movement of rebellion. Well, then it was around that time also that some people began to figure out that it could become like a message board. And Walt Disney was the first person to actually put something on the front of a t-shirt, um, Mickey Mouse probably. And then it, in the 70s is when the t-shirts became that powerful messaging platform that we know today. And we can probably thank the punk movement for a lot of it. Uh, it was a real st place to put a statement, it still is. But now, of course, you can buy a t-shirt anywhere from $5 to $5,000, depending on, I'm exaggerating with the 5,000 probably, but you know, there's some very expensive t-shirts out there that have become uh, the logo, the message, the whatever. And now, you know, t-shirts are not just undergarments because they are sometimes that layer, which I wear as that layer for warmth, but I wear them under jackets, under other garments, but also as a standalone garment. So t-shirts are here and I can't fathom that I ever lived without them, but obviously I live a long time without them. So. Um, so we're going to talk about all the t-shirts that we have in our collection and boy, putting this together, I realized how many t-shirts we have made. And I also know that for years and years and years, I never sewed on knits because I always sew woven fabrics with cotton thread. And so my collection of thread used to be all cotton thread. And now when I really look at my stash of thread, I have equally and possibly even more polyester thread than cotton thread. And it's polyester thread that I use to sew knits and t-shirts and whatever. And I don't know about you, but I can maybe go to a store and try to find a t-shirt, but you know, they don't always fit. They're too long, which I could shorten, but why? Um, they have a, an odd neck or the wrong length of sleeve or they're a funny color or I can't find colors of them that I want. So I make a lot of t-shirts and I realize that I've made a lot of them when I really look at the collection. But we're gonna start with one of our good standard, all-purpose t-shirts, and that's called the ET. 
Now, in the old days, we used to have just a handful of digital download patterns, and we always prefaced the name of the pattern with a, a lowercase e. So the ET was one of the very first e digital patterns that we had. We now have so many digital patterns that we've long since dropped the e thing. But still, ET tells me that this is the first t-shirt we ever had, and it's our possibly most basic t-shirt. So what I like about this t-shirt is that it has a very nice curved hem to it. And it does swing away from the body just a little bit at the sides. Some people don't like that. You can still sew it straight if you want to. But I happen to like that shaping to this t-shirt. So this is not a straight seam on the side. It's, it's a curved seam. And so it's a very graceful look. The sleeve is moderately short. Um, we can lengthen it or shorten it, make it more of a cap sleeve or make it any length in between. The neckline is fairly standard, just a standard crew neck using our famous ready to wear uh, binding technique. You can make it as a long sleeve, of course, and you can make it in lots of different weights of knits from a jersey knit to a French terry to a sweatshirt weight fleece uh, to a very light tissue weight, maybe a silk knit. And this is the shirt that you can wear under a lot of things because it is a little more close fitting than some of our other t-shirts. It doesn't have to be, but you can make it that way. And I do make this as my undershirt many times in a basic color. So if you're interested in knowing how to lengthen a sleeve, we have a really good tutorial called ET Evolution. And that is a very nice tutorial that teaches you how to lengthen a sleeve. So that tutorial will be on sale today, as will a lot of other tutorials as well. So that's, those are the two basic ET patterns or variations. And then Aaron, did you make this or did I make this? I think maybe I made this, but Aaron wears I just it. Wore it yeah, mm -hmm. it looks so great. She actually takes this home every once in a while and wears it someplace. Uh, so at any rate, this is the ET pattern with the long sleeve. She's taken the width of the ready to wear binding piece, which is normally around two and a quarter inches wide, and just simply made it wider and to make more of a funnel neck. So you don't have to really reinvent this. You can use the actual pattern piece for the binding and simply make it any width that you want. It could be a big cowl, little cowl, narrower binding, whatever. And then it's been cut off and these mesh panels have been added to the bottom of it. Now, I got this idea by walking into an Eileen Fisher store in Minneapolis a few years ago, and there was a garment very much like this on the hanger, and I remember coming home and, and making something that sort of kind of looked like it. So there are many variations of the ET, but the basic ET is right there. So then from there, we have a garment called the Swing Tee. And this has a similar property in that it has a similar neckline, although it's a little more open than the ET. Now, of course, you can take the neckline from one pattern and superimpose it on another pattern and get any sort of opening that you want, which I do many times. But the Swing Tee does have a little wider opening than the ET. It has a very similar fit through the bust and the shoulders. It definitely sets on the shoulder. In fact, this has a narrow shoulder to it, so remember that. If you are narrow shouldered, you are likely not to have to narrow the shoulder. Um, I sometimes will even widen the shoulder, and Erin has to widen the shoulder if she makes a swing tee as well, because she has big shoulders. But a nice, normal sleeve length, but now we have the swing. We have a wider hip area, but still a nice, graceful hemline to it. Then we got into all kinds of variations of sleeves. So here is the swing tee with a cap sleeve. You can see that it's about two inches shorter than the original. But the same swing, and these are these nice viscose knits that drape so well. 
You can also sort of see the evolution of my making these because the first ones that I've made have straight stitches for the hem stitch and then I bought a cover stitch machine. And from now, I can tell that I made this one after I made this one because this one has cover stitching on the hems and the neckline and the sleeves. And now that's all I do on, on um, tees. Of course, you can do any length that you want. You can take this, this same cap sleeve swing tee and lengthen it to become a tunic or a dress. Makes a wonderful, wonderful summer dress if it's short sleeve or of course if it's long sleeve, uh, then it would be a more all purpose dress. And you can also do a long sleeve using that same method that we show in that ET evolution tutorial. So we have three sleeve lengths so far, and it could be anything in between, of course. You could do three-quarter length. And then, just like Erin did on the, or I did, I guess, on the uh, ET dress with the panels, this has the funnel neck. Now, on the ET dress, the blue one, that funnel was probably about two inches, and this is probably about three inches. So see, I've just taken that same ready to wear binding piece and extended the width and made it whatever I wanted. So this has the variation of the funnel neck and the long sleeve from the regular swing tee pattern. The swing tee pattern is a digital download pattern and not a printed pattern at this point. We've done V neck variations both in the short version and in the dress version, we have uh, quite an extensive tutorial on how to make the swing tee into a dress. And this has a seam here that dies into this hidden pocket. And this V-neck variation has a very narrow binding to it and the binding is overlapped here at the bottom. I realize that I don't have, what I don't have here is another swing tee variation of a v-neck that has the more traditional method of putting the binding on and then sewing a little v here to create the v. This one ends and overlaps here, but traditionally it continues and connects at the center back. And this, you see, has more of a three-quarter length sleeve. And then we put out one that I called the split swing tee which I really like because it has more of an asymmetric hem. It has this same seam that came from the dress. So here is a seam that opens into a split. Now you can leave it like this, which I do often, or you can use these as tails to tie this and create another look. Sometimes I'll play with just a few little details of swing tees. For instance, just change the binding to a little stripe. That's a very signature sewing workshop detail. And notice that this sleeve is just another length, another variation, not long, not short, not cap, whatever. But the same swing. And then sometimes, just to shake it up a little bit so that it doesn't look like, we're, like I wear the same swing tee every day, um, I'll put a seam down the front. And this is an overlapping seam. Because knits don't ravel, then of course you can just cut off one seam allowance um, and overlap it to another seam allowance that is there. And so that, and it just makes a nice little detail. Something to shake it up a little bit. This hem allowance I've even made a little bit deeper just to give that another look. This has uh, the cover stitch with the wide setting of the needles and normally I'm using something that's more narrow. So I wanted the stitching to be more of a feature on this. All right, I think that's all the swings for the moment. It's a lot of swings. We have a lot of swings. It must be a favorite. <laughs> it's one of my favorites. What I have on today actually um, with a three-quarter length sleeve, but, um, and I'm wearing a beautiful scarf that Samantha Plo gave me, um, 
that has an embroidery design on it from um, Lou Gardner, Gardnier, whatever her name is. Um, anyway, one of my favorites, and I'm wearing it with uh, Picasso pants. So I like that combination of profiles. All right, the next series is the Noto Tea. Now, the Noto Tea is actually a revisit of one of our very first t shirts from many years ago that was called the, I knew I was going to get in trouble, Milano Tea. That was it. That was a printed pattern. This is now a download pattern. So, this has no set in sleeve. This has an extended sleeve uh, that becomes more like a cap sleeve. So, this is a great t shirt to wear. Uh, as of this undergarment. Um, it's, it would be difficult to, to, it's not impossible, but I probably wouldn't bother to make a long sleeve with this. So I think this is a short sleeve t-shirt. But I do like the deep hem. It's a nice, uh, almost two inch wide hem. And I think that's a nice look. The wider the hem, I think the more designer it is. When you see really high end t-shirts, they generally have nice hefty hems to them instead of just skimpy little hems. And this has a narrow binding to it. The original binding technique was more of a wrap. And before I knew that ready to wear binding technique that we now just do all the time, I was doing a more traditional wrapping the edge like we do in woven fabrics. This also makes a wonderful dress. And just like I did on the uh, swing tee, I put a seam down the front, overlapping. It has the same sleeve cap. It has a nice, deep seam allowance at the shoulder, which is a different little uh, tech uh, feature. And so you top stitch that at one inch from the shoulder seam. And I did put the ready-to-wear binding on this. And I can see that it needs to go to the cleaners. <laughs> deep hem, cover stitched and a nice split on the side. So this would make a, a fun, fun summer dress. Um, I actually have one of these in deep dark navy, and it's a very nice basic dress to wear year round. You could put a beautiful jacket over it, a sheer jacket, long or short or whatever. And this could be a very basic formal dress or put this with sandals and wear it as a very casual dress. Actually, our very, very first t-shirt, I guess I should have shown this first, huh? Um, was the Trio t-shirt. And this was part of a pattern that had a jacket or a shirt and pants. The pants that are very similar, actually, to the Picasso pants that I have on. They were the Trio pants. So we broke out the t-shirt from that pattern that became discontinued as a printed pattern. And we now have the Trio t-shirt as a digital download pattern. And by the way, this comes in plus sizes. So when you order this pattern, you get all the sizes. Is that correct? Yes. Correct. Extra small to up to, I think, three or four or five X. I can't really remember. I think it's four X. Four X, But I it think. says on the description. Yeah. So uh, the nice thing about this t-shirt is it looks like a raglan in that it has that detail line, but those of you who think you can't wear raglan because you're sloped shouldered or narrow shouldered, well, you can wear this one because there's a seam that starts at the neck and comes down the center of the sleeve. And so you can shape that to fit you exactly. You could put it on before you sew the front and back together, and you could actually pin this to fit the exact shape of your body. You could even put it back, put it forward, but definitely right there. So you're not going to have these, this lump of shoulder where it's not supposed to be. It can fit you exactly. So it is a little fuller through here. So people who are uh, busty love this t-shirt because it fits so nicely. And it does have a nice shape to it. It's fairly trim through the body. You can widen it if you need to, but it is a fairly fitted t-shirt through the hips. You can see that this is fairly narrow. If you are someone who needs to add a little bit, well, it's easy to do, just make it wider. But I, th I think this is a beautiful t-shirt. And this is a nice little detail to just add a little bit of clear elastic 
for two or three inches along that seam and allow that to gather up. That's a nice little detail. You could do that on anything, but because there's a seam there, it makes it super easy to do that. Then we have a variation of that called the um, swing, what is this called? The swing trio T. Yes. So it looks like the trio T in the front. Exactly. Here are the raglan, sleeve, or raglan lines and the seam down the sleeve. But in the back, there's now a, an inverted pleat. And the back has been lowered and curved a little bit differently. So it's much wider. It's more like the swing tee in terms of width. This is a nice detail. This is sewn from the neck down about four inches and then a little triangular uh, bit of top stitching there at the top of the pleat. But that makes a nice change to the trio tee. And that's how to do this is in a tutorial called the swing trio tee. So that's the trio. We can't talk t-shirts without talking about the Helix T. And I brought this one to show you because I've inserted a bit of trim in the seam. And that's the, really the only way you can see how this is like a swirl. In that the seam is here and comes all the way back up here by the sleeve. So it looks like a raglan line. Same thing here. Very interesting construction. You have to trust us on the construction. And if you, the very first step is how to do the very first seam, and you have to just go with it. And then it'll all fall together. But it's very non-traditional sewing, so it makes it kind of fun. You know, I don't know about you, but sometimes I just want to make something that's just a little bit different instead of two fronts and a back and two sleeves and a collar. You know, let's make something fun. So this is the Helix T. And uh, it's fairly squared off, uh, maybe just a tiny bit of a flare to it, but uh, definitely a, a more straightforward shape. You can't forget about a pattern. We have two patterns that have two knit top t-shirts in them. And one is the Odette and Ivy. So this is the Odette, very interesting construction. Again, we have the raglan seams here. This has a seam, that curved seam here, that's like a princess seam on just the left side only. And then the right side, there's a dart. Interestingly enough, it's built in such a way that you look completely symmetrical when it's on. It doesn't look like this dart is wrong or the seam is wrong. The, the uh, bust fullness is the same for both. And then you have these interesting peplum panels in asymmetric shapes that attach to the bottom. This is one of my favorite pieces just because it's so unusual. Here you have another curved seam and the peplums coming into that. I've made this many times with shorter sleeves for summer. The sleeve is long in the pattern. In fact, it's pretty super long. And so everybody needs to check the length of this before you make it because you might want to shorten the sleeve. And you would shorten it where the elbow is in the center of the sleeve. Just check it. Um, maybe it's fine for most people, but I find it to be a little bit long for me. So that is the Odette. And this is the Ivy, both in the same pattern. So this is more of a tunic, has a nice open neck to it. Of course, you can transpose any shape that you want, close it up if you want to. But a lot of people like a more open neck. This is a neck that actually has been transposed to other t-shirts that people like. And this has the peplums also, but there's not as much fitting uh, that has to happen in the hips. So there's this insertion of a panel here, and then the loose peplums at the bottom. And the back does have a center back seam, and then the peplum across the bottom. 
One sleeve has an insertion to it. Like that. And one does not. So that is the Odette and the Ivy. And then another twosome is the Alex and Olive. And the Alex is also a, more, a little more of a tunic, I think, although it's not super long. But there is an A-shape seam detail to this. There's a seam here and a seam here. Thus the reason it's called the Alex. Not only is that the name of my daughter, but um, it's an A. And you have the cowl. Now, if you don't want a cowl, let's say you want to make this for summer, and you don't want all of that around your neck, take this piece and simply make it narrower to make a traditional binding. By doing that, you don't have to recalculate the length of the binding. You, that's already been done for you, so you just play with the width of it. This is doubled, so this is a fold up here. And if you have fabric that is really, really bulky and you feel like that's going to be too much, well, then just cut it as a single layer and hem it on the top. But you have these asymmetric points at each side and a long sleeve, which also can be short. The back has a little bit of easing right through here, just a little bit of gathering. And it's the, the A shape is gone from the back. And then the other piece that's in the same pattern, which is the olive. I've also made this many times with short sleeve for the summer. And I've, I've transposed the swing tee neck onto this because I personally am not someone who likes a neckline this deep. But um, everyone is different about that. But this has a very asymmetric seam line going on. Here's this seam, side seam, so to speak, that's coming forward. And on the other side, it is here. Now, this has a cutout on the hip, so to speak. Many times, I will cut that straight across and fill that in. This is a seam, and this is decorated with an exposed zipper. So the zipper is on top of this seam. It's a totally non-functioning zip, non zipper. You do not need to zip or unzip this garment to get it on. It's just an interesting feature, and you can see that it's upside down. So it's, it's fun to play with zippers that are interesting, maybe rhinestone or a color. Or you could even decorate the zipper tape uh, with paint or ribbon or a decorative stitch on your sewing machine to make that even more fun. Or you can simply leave it off. You can take this left side and right side and combine them, tape them together, and cut that clear across, fill that in, and just have a standard asymmetric hem t-shirt. And again, you can shorten the sleeve or do whatever you want there. So that is the lineup of t-shirts. We do have a couple more, but um, I just kind of wanted to show you for sure the ones that I consider more basic, and then a couple of the ones that are not as ba basic that are just a lot of fun to make. OK, any questions so far? We do. <clears throat> is the arm's eye the same on the ET and swing T? Um, I can't tell you that. I haven't compared them like that. Um, I, think I think they're similar, but I honestly don't know. I have not, comp I have not put one on top of the other. I would think there'd be a little difference because how narrow the shoulder is yeah. on the swing versus on the mm -hmm. ET, so there's going to be not Probably. as much shaping. <clears throat> yeah. How do you widen shoulders? Oh, well, uh, we have in our fitting encyclopedia that technique. I can't tell you which page it's on, but um, it is a method of, tr whether you're narrowing or widening, it's a method of tracing the original arm's eye of your size and then finding the point at which you want to narrow it and then superimposing that traced 
arm's eye back on there, starting at that new point, and pivoting that till the bottom of it lines up with the side seam, and then you trace that. I went over that very quickly, but do check out our uh, fitting encyclopedia because that method is in there. And so you're either going this way or this way, depending on whether you're narrowing or widening. Can we see the inside of the ruched sleeve section on the trio? Uh, let's see here if we can see what that looks like. So this is actually um, that little piece of elastic is inserted under the seam allowance and then it's pulled and stitched. Somebody said, page nine on the fitting book. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> she just happened to have it right there. We do a lot of tracing of original curves because you don't really want to get into redrafting a curve to insert a sleeve. So it's maintaining the original shapes of things and just pivoting them and moving them. I just want to point out, someone did have a question on how you put the trim in on that helix, um, but Betsy did post a link to a Facebook All right. live that you did explaining okay. that well, in detail. Yeah, just basically it's, um, uh, I cut, I decided how much I wanted to be exposed. Let's say that's uh, 3 eighths of an inch, and I added 5 eighths of an inch for a seam allowance, so that would be 7 eighths wide, a strip. And I've just laid that on to one section and sandwiched that between the two pieces that I'm sewing together sewed it, and when you open it up, it's exposed. Super easy. How do you do a full bust adjustment on the helix? Uh, you don't. It's, it's pretty generous, I think. Yeah. <clears throat> Can the helix be lengthened to a dress length? Oh, yeah. I think the helix would be great as a dress. Well, I say that. Um, yeah, it would be, actually. It's, we have length and shortened lines on it. Uh, the two, the back and the front, are essentially the same shape. They're a long, rectangular shape. And by the time they're put together into this swirl, it creates this garment. And there, is a length and, there are length and shortened lines on both pieces in order to lengthen it. And I don't remember when this was, but we did a Facebook Live um, where I made um, that kind of... Um, really textured kind of sweater knit, uh, black and white, uh, lengthened helix. So oh, I think you would just yeah. need to lengthen it, uh, you know, yeah. again, yeah. Or continue to lengthen it. And I think it would be great. All right, looks like Betsy's posting some good links and answering some of these questions. Um, do the patterns with the asymmetric lines include lengthening lines? Um, yes. Because I always need to lengthen. Okay, this refers back to the helix again, I guess. Yes. <clears throat> now, you know, I think in a Facebook Live at some point, I may have demonstrated how to do that because the piece is such an asymmetric shape that when you lengthen it, you have to be sure that you always maintain the straight of grain line and that's where you lengthen it, then you have to shore up the seams to make them uh, continuous. You don't, you don't line up the edges. So be sure and, and understand that or refer back to a, fa a former Facebook Live, previous Facebook Live of how to do that. If I buy a specific month of So Confident, do I have access to it after the month is over or, do I have to, or do, can I have access to it all the time? Um, you have access to it forever. It's always on your course page. I would love to see a demo on how to finish a cover stitch so it looks beautiful. That's a good idea. Yeah. I've been thinking about doing a cover stitch short tutorial video, and that's on my list to do at some point. 
I think a demo of that would be better than a Facebook Live, uh, because, so you could actually see me do it. So I'll just plan on, I'll do that sometime soon. <laughs> if I do a round back adjustment as shown in the fitting book, how do I compensate in the sleeve for the extra half inch added on the back? You don't, if you really look at that technique in the fitting book, that does not go into the arm side. You stop at the seam line. So you never are adding to the arm side. You're only adding in the, where you need it. And Betsy just posted a link to the lengthening the helix video. Okay. So that's great. Betsy knows. She's the encyclopedia of <laughs> sewing workshop. She knows where everything is. And that is a good thing to point out, though, that we do have that information on the website now. Under yes. videos, you can access the list of previous Facebook Lives, and it's listed by pattern. I mean, I refer to it when I need to find something. Yeah. So. I think that's great to have. Yeah, our content from the tutorials and learning is so deep now that we can't remember things anymore. So yeah, that, that index is on our website. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's all I see. Okay, well let's look at a few fabrics. But before I do that, I do, do want to mention that um, my uh, Sewing Knits Fit to Finish book is quite comprehensive on knowing about uh, basic fittings. I believe that uh, rounded back is probably in here now that I think about it. I'm just sure it is. Uh, fitting a t-shirt, lengthening and shortening, and then all about the various varieties of knits and then lots and lots of techniques for neck bindings and elastics and whatever. So check this out. This is kind of my little Bible of sewing knits. Um, so today we're just going to talk about jersey knits, which is just one little component of all of the knits. And I say little, it's actually probably the most common kind of knit that's out there today, but it's a very specific uh, form of knitting. It's a single knit, and it's identified by the fact that you have these rib textures on the face of the fabric, the lengthwise ribs, which is like a knit stitch if you're a knitter. And on the back side, you have horizontal rows which is like a purl stitch. So you have knit on the face and purl on the back. But they can be anything from very, very tissue weight silk uh, 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 knits to completely heavy, gutsy sweater knits and, and everything in between. So a jersey knit can be silk, wool, cotton, linen, polyester, viscose and all the variations of rayon. So just because it's jersey doesn't mean it's cotton or rayon. It can be any of the fibers that exist today um, and different, completely different weights. I have two different classes on Craftsy that I think are good. One is the Ultimate Guide to Sewing Knits, which is separated by weights of knits. So it starts with the lightest weight, how to sew tissue weight knits, a typical seam finish and other details for tissue weight, all the way to the very heaviest of knits, a sweater knit, and, and recommendations for seam finishes and so forth for that weight and everything in between. The other one is called, I think, just sewing knits, can't remember, um, and it's, um, it's more by technique. So both of them are good, you can still sign up for them, um, check that out. So, but what I have on the wall is not so much this great array of coordinating colors because they are kind of at odds with one another occasionally, but I, I specifically chose them because they represent different fibers and fiber contents. But all of them are jerseys and all of them are t-shirt weight jerseys. Now, all of these jerseys are gonna be on sale this week, including the 50 plus other colors of solid jerseys. So I couldn't put all of them on the board here. Uh, I'm just going to go through a few of them. So let's, and I have to read the tags because sometimes you can't really identify what they are until you read it. But this is uh, rayon of bamboo. And that means that this particular method of producing the rayon was made using bamboo in, as the wood pulp uh, combined with chemicals to make this particular rayon. And there's a whole other video that I've done on rayon and all of those varieties of rayons and the, te the uh, 
the wording about rayon and viscose and modal and lyocell and all of that. That's a whole other uh, pretty good Facebook Live, I think. But whenever you have rayon, you have something that's very, very drapey. It's, it's like I have on. And it's very comfortable. It's very soft. Uh, it's probably one of the softest of the fibers that you can wear. Um, all knits, with the exception of polyester, actually wrinkle. You know, we think of knits as that non-wrinkling thing that we travel with. Well, rayon and, and cotton, they all wrinkle. So if you're wanting totally non-wrinkling knit, you're going to want to use polyesters, which we have very few of, as I realized. So this is rayon of bamboo. And this is viscose and spandex. Now, both of these have spandex. So that means that there's good recovery to a knit. You can stretch it out, and it'll go back to the way it was. When there's no presence of lycra or spandex or elastic, then it's likely not to recover very well and could stretch out. So that means that you could wear this as a bottom weight, but these are, in my opinion, light enough weight to wear mostly as tops and t-shirts. But so this one is viscose. So this is just a different rayon. We don't know what wood was used to make this rayon, this viscose. We know that bamboo was used here. Who knows what was used here? I, I had a conversation with a young man uh, here in Topeka well, a couple of years ago, and he actually works at our DuPont plant here, and they work with viscose. So I was asking him about that, and he says, oh, they use every kind of wood imaginable to make viscose. So you sometimes never know really what it is. But when they say bamboo, they're trying to tell you that it's sustainable, which is a little bit complicated because when you have to make the rayon of bamboo, you're still working with chemicals and it's not as sustainable as they'd like for us to believe. But at any rate, so it still has the same drape, beautiful drape, beautiful saturation of color. Both of them are rayon. This happens to be labeled viscose and this is rayon of bamboo. Now this, we have, uh, quite a few colors of this rib knit, and the rib knit is viscose. This is just rayon. So here we have three rayons, three varieties of rayon, but this has a slight raised rib texture. I pulled this one out because Alex has a pair of West End pants in this and a Eureka top, and she wears this, pardon me, Alex, all the time. <laughs> And it's become her travel outfit. Uh, every time we're on a plane together, she's wearing this because it does not wrinkle. Uh, I think it's the rib texture that prevents it from wrinkling. And the recovery is fantastic. And it's just super comfortable to, to wear for travel. So rib knits, we're, we're including that, the rib knits in the solids today. This one is, this is also bamboo, rayon with bamboo, but it's combined with cotton. So it has a little different characteristic in terms of the feel. This is super drapey. This is drapey, but not quite as drapey because of the cotton. So anytime you have cotton, you're going to lessen the degree of drapeability. But nevertheless, it's a gorgeous drapey rayon. All right, so now we come over to the cottons, I think. So this is organic cotton. And you can see that by comparison, the drape is different. Doesn't make it any less desirable, but it would be, it if you were to make a swing tee in this, it would have a little more structure than if you'd make a swing tee in this, it's gonna be very lengthening. So this might be a, maybe a little bit more appropriate for an ET, although honestly, I think I'd make any knit garment out of this if I love the color. But very soft, very nice, and very natural. And if you're into organic products, then this fits that category. This is all cotton with spandex. So whereas this does not have spandex and could, if you can see that, kind of doesn't have as much recovery, this has recovery. Well, it should. <laughs> it has spandex, and I know it does. Um, yeah, 5% spandex. Now, you can see, you can always identify the right side, because here's that curl that we've been talking about. When you pull a fabric 
on the cross grain, it always curls to the right side. That's how you can tell. If you, if you can't really see the lengthwise ribs on the face and the horizontal rows on the back, then pull it on the cross grain and you, yeah, that will identify this. See, this one we've hung on the wall with the wrong side out because the curl is going that direction. There's the curl. There's the curl. So, curl. All right, so then uh, the only two polyesters that I could find in our whole stash, and that may not be accurate, we may have more, were these. Um, so this is polyester and spandex. This has a little glazing to it, but still super drapey and does not wrinkle. Now, everybody's problem with polyester, if you have a problem with it, is that it can't, tends to be a little warmer, um, it's, it's a, uh, which I like for some things, but not always. And I do love the fact that it doesn't wrinkle. This is a nice polyester uh, blend. Has a heather texture to it. This is polyester and viscose. And I like that property because when you have polyester in a knit, it's going to have more stability and the most recovery of any knit. This is a nice heather knit. Probably, again, we've hung it on the wrong side. No, this is the right side. Yeah. And then this one uh, comes from uh, another resource of ours, and this is Modal, and 57% cotton, so it has that cotton look. It's a little duller finish when you have cotton than, than viscose. Viscose has, I wouldn't call it a sheen, but it definitely has a finish looking uh, more, slightly more sophisticated knit. So anyway, 57 and a half percent cotton, 37 and a half percent modal, which is another kind of rayon, it's another processing of rayon, and five percent uh, spandex. This also has this certification attached to it, this OCA Tech certification, which means it meets the standards of having manufactured it sustainably and all of that. So sometimes we have that uh, added to our description of fabrics. I don't think we always know that when we get the fabrics. But not as much drape because of that cotton, but still a really nice, nice feel to it. So 50 plus, maybe even 60 colors, all kinds of variations. All of these are suitable for any of the garments that I showed you. Um, it just depends on the look that you want and the color that you're after. So we have a few more questions. All right. Any suggestions for taming the curl while you work? Yes, it depends on, uh, I'm assuming you're talking mostly about the hem because it's curling on the horizontal. So what we do is use fusy web to fuse to the very edges. That completely tames it, and then by the time you have, quote, fused or glued the hem down, it's flat and you can sew it. So that's how I deal with it. If it's um, uh, if it's really curly, then I'll kind of drag it along my uh, fabric covering of my ironing surface to open it up and then quickly put the fusy web on and then it's stabilized. Hemming rib knits has always been hard for me. No matter how, I, how hard I try, I get rippling. Is there a tutorial dealing with this? On the rippling? Mm -hmm. That's all about fusy web and nailing things down before you try to sew them. That fusy web has saved everything for us for sewing knits, on hems, on the bindings. Um, it, it, it's amazing stuff. But I also use a walking foot. I sometimes use tissue paper underneath uh, all of it to stabilize. But all of those tips for the right throat plate, the right needle, the right presser foot, the right fusy web application are all in those basic uh, tutorials that we have called sewing with knits and sewing a knit wardrobe. What type of jersey knit is best for showing fewer lumps and bumps? Well, I think that the cottons uh, show fewer lumps and bumps than the viscose rayons. Uh, this is going to show fewer lumps than this one, for example. Can you explain how to make the turtleneck variations on these tees? On the tees? I thought I did that. 
I'm going to do it again? Okay. Um, I think sometimes people pop on later and all right, don't okay. hear earlier Very explanations. Good. So. All right. Well, first of all, this is a tutorial. And it is, I'm not sh uh, it's on Series 7 of So Confident, fourth quarter, the swing tee with the funnel neck, explains it very well. So you take the pattern piece that's included with the pattern, which is for the regular half inch wide ready to wear binding. And that piece, I think pattern piece is two and a quarter inches wide. You're going to make it whatever width you want for a funnel neck and apply it in the same way. Is the knit book on sale? The knit book is not on sale. Unfortunately, I'm not Amazon. <laughs> That's good. Uh, do you have any Alabama Channing? Oh, well, yet? I will say this. I do sign them. <laughs> is my signature worth another $5? I don't know. Yes. <laughs> Maybe yes. not. Okay, go ahead. Uh, oh, do you have any Alabama Channing knit? No, we are completely out of Alabama Channing knits at the moment. Um, we do have some pieces. They're not on the website. If you're interested in something, you might give us a call. Uh, we have some pieces. We're not carrying that knit any longer. Uh, the price point became a little um, out of reach, we thought, for us. So at the moment, we don't have any on order. I would just suggest, if you're interested, just to order it directly from them. Um, so back to the, the turtleneck, um, are you explaining how to create a cowl versus a turtleneck? Would there be a difference? Uh, no, it's just from here to here to here to here, you know, whatever width you want. It's either a cowl or a funnel or a ready to wear binding. It's the same pattern piece, different width. Is the Trio t-shirt swing tutorial on sale? The <clears throat> The Trio T-shirt, yes, it is. The swing. Bag. Yes, it is on sale. Mm -hmm. Do you ever find, or no? Do you ever line fine or drapery knits with trico? If so, do you let it hang free or use it as an underlining? I have personally never lined a knit garment. Now, if I were to line one, it would be more like maybe a nice dress. But I, I have no reason, I have found no reason up to this point to line a t-shirt. Um, but you would, I would, if I were doing a dress, let's say, I would keep it separate at the hem so it's hanging free. Do you have any cotton interlock? Uh, I can't answer that at the moment. Possibly. We, I don't see as many interlocks as I do jerseys. Um, I, I can't tell you why. Um, are all the patterns that you've shown downloads? All right, the ET is a download, the swing T is a download, the Noto is a download, the Helix is print and download. No, no, because no, we no, just, just print the pant uh, The uh, Alex and Olive is print. The Odette and Ivy is print. We had somebody who was wondering why there was a shipping charge, and I'm guessing it's because, you know, some of them are printed patterns. Yes. Some of them aren't. <clears throat> um, there was a question about which T-shirt um, would be better for somebody who has a fuller bust can't find it at the moment, but that's well, pretty much. Well, first of all, in our fitting book, we do mm -hmm. have a method for adding bust fullness without a dart, and two methods for adding fullness in knits. So to me, it doesn't really matter which one. I think it could be the ET or the swing T or the no-toe or any of them other than the helix, which is, I answered that about the helix a little bit quickly. It can be done, but it's difficult, and I can't explain it on the, in Facebook Live. But at any rate, um, so I think it doesn't really matter. Whichever profile you like would be fine. Uh, just use that method for adding bust fullness without a dart. Okay. Okay. Uh, all right. Well, else? we have a lot of things on sale this week. <clears throat> so all of the patterns that are on sale, and they're on sale for 15%, the ET, Swing Tea, Alex and Olive, 
Odette and Ivy, Noto, Trio, and Helix. All of those patterns that I referred to are on sale at 15% off. All of the knits, all 50 plus of the solid jersey knits are at 30% off. And in order to order that, you need to use this code, knit30. You have to put this code in. And it's the only code that you can use. You cannot combine this with another code, let's say a so confident code. So it's simply 30% off, period with this code. Then we have a lot of tutorials on sale, and I will go through them, uh, but you're probably not going to remember a single one of them. But that ET evolution that talks about lengthening the body and the sleeves of any t-shirt, really, is a great one. And then we have four, the whole series seven of So Confident, first, second, third, fourth quarter, deal with all kinds of variations of the swing tee. Cap sleeves, long sleeves, dresses, funnel necks, uh, lace variations, whatever. But it's descriptive in the, on the website as to what each one includes. We have a Noto compendium that talks about three variations of the Noto T. It's a beautiful presentation. The swing trio T, which is the one with the inverted pleat in the back. The mesh blocked ET turtleneck, that's the uh, blue dress with the mesh panels. Sewing with knits, which is a generic overall how to sew knits. And sewing a knit wardrobe is a similar one uh, of how to do necklines and sleeves and hems and use fusy web and all kinds of stuff. So those are all of the tutorials that are on sale. And they are 15% off this week. I have a couple more questions. Okay. Are your patterns for neck binding already reduced into the size that you recommend? Yes, the neck bindings are already reduced. They're 7 8 ratio. They're already smaller. Yeah, now that is your starting point. Frankly, I've never had to change that very often, but occasionally you'll run into a knit that's super stretchy and you need to make it smaller, or a knit that's more stable and you need to make it bigger. But that's a good starting point, and they're all built that way. Where do you find the industrial binding technique you mentioned earlier? So the the ready-to-wear binding technique? I think so. That is, first of all, in all the patterns. If you're buying an ET pattern or a sweetened tea pattern, that method is in there. If you're wanting it independently, it's in the sewing with knits um, tutorial, the sewing and knit wardrobe tutorial, my sewing knits book, and both of my craft, craftsy classes. Okay. All right. Whew. That was a lot today. That was a lot today. <laughs> I know it. I know it. Okay. Well, uh, thank you for joining me, and um, I will see you next week.